Um, look, well, thank you. For, yeah, seriously, uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to, to join you today. And I hope you find what I've got to say of interest. Um, uh, so when, when I was asked a few months ago, sort of would it be uh, willing to, to come along, sort of first reaction is yes. Of course, we know OMSCO is an organisation very well. We've done quite a lot of work with them. Um, and I was sort of shown a draft, uh, a, a draft agenda for the day, and it looked to me like a bit of a dairy orgy. Uh, lots of things going on. You know, oh, sort of the first presentation about dairy, second presentation about dairy, third, fourth, fifth, all about dairy. Absolutely fine, no problem with that whatsoever. Obviously, at Promar, dairy is... Uh, a subject very close to our hearts, um, so, so why not? And OMSCO's business, dairy, you're, you're all involved in the dairy sector, but we also uh, at Promar do quite a lot of work in other areas of agricultural food, and I thought maybe just sort of have a bit of a break from dairy. Lots of other people will be talking about the dairy sector later on and, and already have done, so just have a little bit of a break. I, I'm a really strong believer in sort of transferable lessons from other sectors. Maybe you can't learn everything, you can't be exactly like they are, but you can look at what other industries are doing, what other organisations are doing, and maybe, maybe take some of what they're doing and apply it to your business. Um, and so that's what I'm going to try and do today. So look, so who, who, who are we, or who am I from? I work for Promar International. Um, obviously the dairy sector is, uh, is a subject very close to our heart, or an industry very close to our heart. If you, if you wind our, our sort of uh, family tree back, you find the Milk Marketing Board, we're up in Cheshire, occasionally the phone goes and people say, is that the Milk Marketing Board? You say, well, sort, sort of, uh, we were, but not, not anymore. Um, um, so we have about 90 consultants in the UK, many of them are out on farm and, and some of them uh, you, you will know uh, and some of them you may actually use. Uh, so please c carry on doing that if you, if you don't mind. Um, but we're, we're also sort of a, a broader based market research and consultancy, so we do a lot of work outside the UK. I think last year we worked in about 40 different countries uh, around the world, and as well as our work in uh, the dairy sector, we're also working in many other areas of agriculture and food, so that might include the beef, pork, cereals, and <coughs> I, I personally have done a lot of work in horticulture, and I think it's quite an interesting industry to look at to see some of the transferable lessons about what people in horticulture do and how they might apply to, to a business like OMSCO and, and your own, uh, own, own farms. And then, in turn, we're owned by Genus. Uh, there's no secret of that. They're, they're our parent company. Um, having said I'm not going to talk about dairy much, it would seem silly not to sort of say anything about dairy. You might think, hey, somebody from Promar came along and didn't say anything about dairy. Um, I think, obviously... D um, while the UK dairy sector, European dairy sectors and other ag uh, agricultural industries are having a, 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 a tough time at the moment and it would be uh, naive to d downplay the seriousness of the situation in some parts of the dairy sector in particular, I think what we do see, and this is taken from, uh, uh, from, from a, a report that's come from Tetra Pak, that sort of mid, mid to long term, sort of d dairy demand around the world looks very, very strong. And I think there's a bit of a danger sometimes we get sort of we can get sort of obsessed with what's happening sort of in the 1st of October. We need to be also, we, we need to pay attention to what's happening in the short term and manage our businesses accordingly, but also we need to have a, a, bigger, a bigger view of what's happening in the rest of the world. And this one shows basically where, where there's red, it's sort of de the dairy exporters, so countries like New Zealand, um, uh, 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 Australia, p parts of Europe, parts of North America, they're all the sort of the, the major dairy exporting powerhouses, and, and Richard's going to talk about international markets a bit later. I understand, but the, the, bl the blue areas or the, the mar parts of the world which are marked blue, that's where they're, they're importers of dairy products or net importers of dairy products. So there's some great par big parts of the world that are, will remain net importers. It doesn't matter how much they invest in their own domestic dairy industry. Um, so uh, most of Southeast Asia, most of China, most parts of North Africa, other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of uh, the, uh, Central America, these are all areas of the world where they will remain, in our view, net dairy importers, and that's a wonderful opportunity. Having the opportunity and taking advantage of it is slightly different, so it seems to me that exporting is inherently pretty hard work, um, and you have to be very sort of focused on what you're doing and face up to pretty strong competition in many other parts of the world. The, the other area which is blue, of course, is Russia. They are a big dairy importer, and, and obviously at the moment Europe isn't able to export to, to, to Russia. Um, depending on, there's all sorts of sort of things on the internet about when the Russian ban will be lifted. You know, it's not, it's not going to be this year, is it? It might be next year. I saw something last, last night on the internet saying, you know, they'll think about lifting it in 2018. Mm, that's sort of very generous of them. Um, but uh, so Russia, big dairy export, uh, big dairy importer, not for us at the moment. So we have to think about other parts of the world, probably. Um, but long term, 
mid to long term, demand for dairy products around the world is very, very strong. Um, and I know that the, 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 uh, the, the theme of the conference is looking at sort of how, how companies can add value. And I think um, in the work we do at Promar, there, there's all sorts of companies. Uh, so I could have spent the next half hour talking about these companies, whether it's Arla, Glambeer, Friesland, Valio, Yakult, Long Claws and Dairy, a bit closer to home. These are all great examples of companies that are adding value to their products. And they all go about it doing it in a different, slightly way, so sort of slightly different way. Um, but we could spend the next half hour talking about them. You probably know those companies quite well. I might not tell you anything that you perhaps don't already know. But the, the, I think the other thing there is that it doesn't. There's no, there's no sort of one. You can be a, a Danish company, an Irish company, a British company. So adding value, anybody can do it. It seems to me if you get the fundamentals right. It's not. It's not the preserve of any one particular uh, part of the world. You know they're better at it than us. Anybody can do this if they get the fundamentals right. Um, but. What can we learn from other sectors? So this is one of our clients at Primar International we do a lot of work with. It's the Pink Lady, Pink Lady Apple organization. I'd be interested to know how many people in the room of, are aware of Pink Lady Apples. Thank you. How many, how many people buy them? Yeah, they're quite expensive. That's about right. I've got a graph that shows that later on. It's interesting about creating awareness and purchase are very different things. So when you've got your marketing objectives being set, sort of we want to create awareness. That's, that's a great thing to do. But actually, you've got to get people to buy it. Making people aware is only half the battle. And the, I think Pink Lady have recognized that's the case. So um, yeah, sort of snapshot with the, the Pink Lady organization. We've only got sort of 15, 20 minutes to do this. But, but, but Pink Lady apples are grown all around the world. They're grown in Europe, mainly in France and, and Italy. Uh, you can grow pink, pink, ap pink skinned apples in the UK, but I'll, I'll tell you a bit about why you can't grow a pink lady at the moment. Uh, they grow them in South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, Chile, China, Argentina, America. The, the people often think it's, you know, the varietal name is, oh, I had a pink, the, the varietal name is actually uh, Crips Pink. Uh, there was a guy in Australia, uh, uh, a plant, uh, a, a fruit physiologist created his name was Cripps. He created, I think, a couple of years back in the sort of late 70s, he was sort of tinkering around with apple varieties and sort of, oh, I've, I've, created, a, I've created a pink apple. Um, uh, I'm told he didn't mean to do it. He didn't sit down one day and say, that's what I'm going to do. He was sort of doing sort of conventional apple breeding and sort of, hmm, this looks quite interesting. I'll see what we can do with that. But the varietal name is Cripps Pink. The brand is Pink Lady, sort of completely, completely different. Um, and they have become, I think, um, if you look around the world, there's plenty of agricultural sectors which are pretty commoditized. I would say apples are as commoditized as, as, as any. Um, Pink Lady, over a period of time, have managed to keep, keep a premium in the market for, and a consistent premium. So look, uh, having a premium for the next six months, that's great, but you want it for the next six years. They, they, they're looking at sort of 26 years they want a premium for, but they've managed to retain, create and retain the premium uh, over a long period of time, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about how they've done that. Um, production was, at, yeah, so the, uh, John Cripps was in, uh, actually employed by the Department of Agriculture in Western Australia originally, so when they found they got quite a nice looking apple that people might be interested in growing and buying, they, they licensed the, 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 the production of it. So not everybody can be a Pink Lady apple grower. Um, uh, now, the, the, the sort of license uh, rights are held by two organizations. One is uh, Apple and Pear Australia, which is almost sort of the Western, Depart Western Agriculture Department of Agriculture, um, sort of in its modern format, and also a, a French nursery group called Star Fruits. Um, they're about 1% of global apple production. So they're not, they're not massive, they're quite small, they're quite niche, but they have managed to create this very strong brand um, and they managed to sort of create and sustain the premium. Um, and about 48% of the production is in the Northern Hemisphere and about 50, so over 50% is the, in the Southern Hemisphere. So they do have all year round supply of the fruit. Uh, sometimes there are a few tensions between the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, sort of sounds, sounds familiar maybe. Um, but yeah, they, uh, yeah, they've got this all year round supply. So you can buy uh, a Pink Lady Apple all year round. Um, and it will be largely of the one, of the, one of the real challenges they have away from the marketing is just sort of controlling the quality. So Apple's internal bruising and this sort of thing, and they spend a lot of money trying to, trying to solve that issue for them. Um, how have they, they done in the UK? When, when they first started selling Pink Lady Apples, they started, it was probably sort of 20 years ago now, they started very, very small. I think in the first year they sold, Apples are traded in an 18 kilo carton, 
They sold 500 cartons in the first year, nothing. They started absolutely at the bottom. They've built it up over a period of time, and uh, in, so by 2000, they were selling almost 10,000 tonnes, and now they're much higher up, they're about 50,000 tonnes. So they've, they've seen their market grow quite consistently over a period of time, and it's, it's always been on the, uh, largely on the up crease. It's flattened out one or two years. There was a bit of a turning point in the two, 2004, 2005. People say, well, what was happening there? Um, a number of things happened. They started achieving a bit of critical mass in the market, I think, but also they started to see the rewards of some sort of long-term marketing development, I think, um, and this sort of sort of powered them on. And they're now actually the third, the third best-selling apple in, in, in the UK, which I think probably, again, if they started out, sort of if you went back 10 or 15 years ago and said you're going to be the third best apple, having started off by selling um, 500 boxes in the, in the first year, they would have, no, I don't think they'd have believed you. Uh, but they've got to that, and, th and their view is, well, we've got to third, let's stop us, what's going to stop us being second, or maybe even the best-selling apple uh, uh, variety in the, in, in the UK. And also, the other thing I think it will draw attention to later on is it's not all about volume for them, it's just about much the value. So they, they would rather retain their premium and maybe sell a few or less, few or less apples than sell, hey, loads of apples and maybe sort of start eat, eat, eating into that premium. Um, so, in terms of household penetration, uh, they've done very well. So, I think we sort of, uh, this is how many people actually buy apples, and this, some of this data comes from uh, Kantar, our friends at Kantar World uh, Panel. So, about, about one in three apples, so when people put their hands up, how many people actually buy? It probably was about one in three, so this, this room might be quite representative of pink lady apple consumers. But they get, so about one in three households in the UK uh, buy, buy a pink lady apple. And when they first started, very high value, very premium. Uh, this will sell well in Mar Marks and Spencers was their first customer in the UK. Maybe no surprise. Marks and Spencers, uh, Waitrose, Sainsbury's maybe. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's where you would expect to find pink lady apple consumers. They sell them in, Al in, in Aldi and Lidl. They sell them to most major retailers. They've managed to sort of broaden the appeal of the apple to their customer base. But one in, th one in three consumers now, now, or households have, have a pink lady apple in them at some stage. Um, in terms of awareness, again, when I ask you to put your hands up, lots of people put their hands up. So they've got 78% awareness. That's, that's pretty high. Lots of, lots of brands, lots of food products would like to have 78% awareness with their, uh, amongst their consumer base. Um, but making 78%, they've, so, but they've still got lots of opportunity, they feel, because 78% aware and sort of 32% actually buying it means there's quite a big gap between making people aware of the product and people actually getting to buy it. So I think when you talk to them now, rather than being a bit reticent about, oh, we did well with our first 500 boxes, can we really be the third or fourth apple? They're, I think Pink Lady are now saying, well, hang on, uh, we've got 80, almost 80% 80 of the population aware of our product, but we, we've only got a third of them buying it. So there's a, there's a big gap, there's a big gap to go for. Um, how have they done um, in terms of retaining this premium? This, this chart sort of shows the difference between the, the value of them or the volume of the market share they have and, and, the, and the value of the market share they have. So Pink Ladies will outrank in terms of they, they, the value of their product is worth more than the volume of their product, basically, by, by a considerable margin. You look at the other varieties there. Jazz is another apple variety. One of the, they call them the club varieties, where, they, where the production and, and the marketing has been sort of uh, registered or trademarked in some way. So Jazz also commands a, a bit of a premium in the market. But other, uh, other varieties like Gala and Royal Gala and Braeburn, again, grown everywhere, sold everywhere, Overproduced, underconsumed. What happens to the premium? It, it's not there anymore. They're, they're, the, they're in the other situation where the the volume is more p uh, proportionate than the value of the product they have. Uh, so Pink Lady, as much as anything else, they'd love to sell more apples. They'd love you to buy more apples, I'm sure. But they're always thinking about how do we create the value? How do we protect the value of, of the market? Uh, and they've done it very well over a long period of time. They, they have a, they have a marketing campaign. Um, in, in the UK, they've had it for many, many years. Uh, in some ways, it struck me that there's, you know, what, what are, they're doing one or two quite interesting things that maybe other food companies don't do. But in some cases, it's quite conventional. So they have that, they have a sort of competition around. You know, it's a lovely looking apple. Uh, one of its great appeals is the sort of the visual characteristics of the apple. So it's a nice looking apple, and it tastes great. That's a, that's always a good starting point. So products that look good and taste good, I think, uh, that's quite a good idea. But they have, a, they have a competition, a consumer competition around Valentine's Day, pink, obviously the synonymous with the colour. 
they, they do advertising in uh, magazines and print. They have a website. There's a Pink Lady Club. They have a PR program. They have lots of social media they do. Um, they sponsor the London Marathon. So I think part of their thinking is, you know, where are there lots of consumers at any one time that we can try and get messages to? Sort of, yeah, the, the London Marathon. There's a lot of people out on that day, isn't there? They, they sponsor a very upmarket photography competition. A lot of what they do, or what is sort of saying, we've got a premium Apple. We want to be associated with premium events. Let's sort of keep the branding consistent. Um, they, have, they have a particular campaign during the summer months. They also um, support retailers. They think supporting retailers is a good idea with promotional campaigns. Um, and yeah, sometimes the relationship can be a bit, uh, a bit tricky. Uh, but on the whole, I think if you met people from the Pink Lady organization, they would say, yeah, we love retailers. We think they're really good. They make our business. We support them. Um, and they also support things like the, um, yeah, the, the gay pride event in London. It's a bit different, maybe. Um, I think, why do they do that? Well, again, there's, there's the sort of the pink connection, I think, is, is one thing. But also, they're looking at consumers. Who's buying our apples? Where will there be lots of consumers? Um, uh, my understanding these days is you don't have to be a you don't have to be a gay to go to a gay pride event. In fact, one of my friends a year ago said, there's one in Reading where I live, and they said, you're going to love it, John. I said, I'm not quite sure what you mean. But, um, but I, I'm told it's a fantastic weekend. Music, you know, you know, all this sort of thing going on. So they, they sponsor events that are perhaps a little bit unusual. Perhaps you wouldn't expect them to be doing this, but they, they've worked out that that's where some of their target consumers or quite a lot of their target consumers are going to be. So, what, what do they have or what do they do? So, so their, their marketing campaigns, sort of, yeah, a little bit different maybe, but there's quite a lot of that that any respectable food company have. What have they got that's different? I think the first thing is they've got a great apple. That doesn't half help, um, and that's the way it looks, the way it tastes in particular. It's a great, it's a great apple. They also, and I think this perhaps gets into a bit more, uh, but there's other great apples out there as well. So again, what else do they have? They, through their system of royalties and licensing, they actually manage production, um, particularly with the aim of, you know, when, when again, it's, it's difficult sometimes, uh, depending on sunshine levels, and it's a, to, to, to control exactly how much fruit you're going to get off a tree. But they, they put a lot of effort into managing production, particularly when they know maybe the market conditions might be quite volatile or the supply conditions might be volatile. The, um, the they try and avoid oversupplying the market, being blunt. Uh, the one way they manage to keep their premium is to not, they know, they know if they oversupply the market, the premium will come down. So they, they put a lot of effort, a lot of discipline into a, a group of farmers around the world, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, in trying to manage the supply and, and uh, uh, of, 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 their, of their apple. Um, they have the, the, the way the licensing system works and the royalty system is quite complicated, probably for another day. Uh, but it basically benefits everybody who's involved. It benefits the nursery. It, it benefits star fruits. It benefits APEL in Australia. It benefits the grower. It benefits the exporter, the importer, the retailer, and ultimately the consumer, because the consumer, consumer gets a fantastic apple at a pretty competitive price. So the way they've, they've, they've designed this royalty system, and again, I think 20 years ago, they probably will say, mm, you know, this has sort of evolved over a period of time. They didn't sit down 20 years ago and say, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it. They've let it evolve over a period of time. They, I'm sure they would say there's been one, of mistakes, one or two mistakes made on the way. Uh, but they now have this system which benefits everybody in the supply chain, and that seems uh, quite a good idea as well. They're always looking at new derivatives of Crips Pink. Um, there's a lot of work. They do a lot of work on R&D. Is there going to be a better looking fruit or a better tasting fruit? Or the, 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 their biggest problem they have is internal browning, bruising of the fruit. Can we breed an apple that is just, you know, sort of stops that problem for us? They put a lot of effort into that. Um, <coughs> they have this very wide range of consumer facing activity. They, they consistently invest back in the brand. And I've got just a point to make on my next slide about that. So, and they've recognized that sort of, hey, they, they could stand up at their growers AGM and say, look, aren't we doing well? 80% of people recognize our brand, fantastic. Only 30% of people, which is not bad, but only 30% of people buy it. So there's this gap between awareness and buying, and they say that's one of the things we've got to try and uh, try and focus on. So uh, food food companies often sort of look measure their success on how many people know our brand, but I think I think we would say it's about how many people buy it is the, is the real test. Um, and they have a portfolio approach to not only their geographic market, so <coughs> core markets to them, Europe, North America, Japan a little bit, 
Uh, where will they get their growth in the future? They're looking at China. China is maybe the biggest challenge for them in terms of people will try and grow pink lady apples using a royalty system. They found already that people in, pink, in China sort of, um, hey, yeah, we grow pink, pink lady apples, and they, mm, that's a bit strange. We haven't actually sold you the license to do that. That wouldn't worry the Chinese too much, would it? Um, but um, so China, Southeast Asia, parts of Africa, parts of the Middle East, they try and balance the market so they're not overexposed in any one market in, in, in particular. And within, within the UK, they have a, a wide range of customers and they, again, they have a sort of a, a portfolio approach to how they manage those customers, which might range, you know, sort of up at the top end, for people like Waitrose, m and uh, uh, you know, all the way through. They supply all the major retailers. There's not many people who do that. So they, they're pretty good at managing customer relationships. Um, and last slide, yeah, last slide. So the transferable lessons, sort of to, to, to dairy companies, almost to any food company, maybe to any, any sort of business, really. I think they, they talk about you know, the long-term plan they have, which they, when they started 20, 25 years ago, say uh, Cripps invented this variety almost, or produced this variety almost by mistake. They didn't really know, I think they will say, they didn't really know what they had, but they worked out they got a winner. They talk about being a 20-year overnight success story. Um, I think sometimes I'm, in the work we do at Promo, I'm sometimes surprised about how quickly people think that brands can be created, developed, sustained, uh, to, to the point that they've sort of got this high level of recognition and a pretty high level of consumer purchase. So they say, yeah, it, hey, look, we started with 500 boxes in the UK, now we're 50,000 tonnes. Yeah, sort of bit tongue-in-cheek, we're a 20-year 20, 20 overnight success story. All, all the, they, they have um, <coughs> a strong governance uh, system, uh, so growers and importers and exporters from all around the world sit and work, work down what they're going to do. Um, <coughs> all the IPLA members, it strikes me when I've met them and talked to them, they're fundamentally working to the same game. They might not always agree on every single point. They don't have to. Life would be pretty boring if they did. But all the IPLA members basically say, this is what we're trying to do long term. We're trying to create this globe. We want a global brand. We're not, we're not content with where we are. But there's some sort of parameters around which we do that. Um, and there's quite a consensual style of management. It's, uh, they, they almost, uh, as an organization, sort of as a consultant to them, looking in from the outside, it's, it's quite consensual. They, they tend, they try not to argue. They try to sort of see the bigger picture, try and understand each other's point of view. They don't tend to say, Sean, you will do this. They will sort of discuss it and sort of find a find common ground. Seems quite quite interesting. Um, they protect the brand, um, and there's quite a few legal agreements that underpin how the organisation works. But particularly with customers, uh, their, their customers have to pay into the royalty scheme. If they don't, or they try and sell Pink Lady apples as a Crips Pink a apple, which some people do, they'll have a conversation with their customers. If that doesn't work, they'll take them to court. They're not afraid to protect their brand. Um, or at least start the process of taking customers to court. Again, it's probably not a good thing to do to ultimately, maybe, but sometimes they will stand up very strongly for what they believe in, respect our brand, and it's a brand that everybody wants. Uh, they have a very strong R&D base. They talk about value, not volume. Uh, volume is not the end game for them. Protecting the value is. If they sell more apples in a controlled way along the, uh, along the route, that, that's great. Um, they've got the best growers in the world. Not everybody can grow a pink lady apple. So again, a great apple grown by the best growers in the world, that's probably a good starting point with this legal protection around it. Um, they're constantly thinking about innovation. That might be you know, the new varietal developments, the new Crips Pink strains that are going to come on stream. It could be the packaging, the marketing. They're thinking about it as, as an organization when we've talked to them. They seem to be thinking about it all the time. They're almost obsessive about it. And they think, last point, they think about consumers and customers as much as apples. <clears throat> They're all fundamentally apple growers, these guys involved, but they spend a lot of time, they spend quite a lot of time thinking about apples, but they're also always talking about consumers and customers. And I'm not sure that explains exactly how they've done it or all how they've done it, but that seems to me sort of quite a poor, important thing to think about. And Amanda, you'll be pleased to know that's me, over and done with.